We live in a big blue world that is mostly comprised of good, but sometimes evil tries to encroach upon that good. But no need to fret, good citizen, cause when that happens, it's only a matter of time before the sledgehammer of justice falls upon evil's big toe. This is an honest review on the tick, and it is mighty! Evil, beware my battle cry! Spoon! Greetings fanboys and fangirls, I'm Erodin on the Blockbuster Buster. Very soon The Tick, the big blue engine of justice returns in a brand new series on Amazon Prime. And I can't think of no better time to talk about the show that launched the astonishing arachnid into the mainstream. But before we talk about that superb series, let's go back and let's take a look at... The Secret Origins of The Tick. Created by Ben Edlund, The Tick started out as the mascot for the New England comic stores and their newsletter. But the character proved to be so popular that Edlund decided to spin him off into his own independent comic book series, where The Tick became an unrelenting parody of all superhero comics. In Tick number one, we find out that The Tick is a mental patient with amnesia, who for reasons unknown possesses superhuman strength and vulnerability and is dressed in a onesie with a cowl and antenna. Bored out of his mind, he answers the call of the city called the city. Seriously, that's that's what it's called. While there, he decides to use his amazing powers to fight crime and enforce justice, and that his mysterious costume will be his only identity. As from that day forth, friend or foe alike will know him only as the Tick. Where's the jerk who calls himself the Tick? I am that jerk and will come to fear his nonsensical battle cry. Spoon! Mm, I don't get it. Originally intended to be brown to match his arachnid namesake, Edlin decided to change his color to blue when the comic started to be printed in color, as it looked better in print, and Edlin further explained that every major superhero has blue in his costume. Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, Captain America, so it made perfect sense to make the tick completely blue from head to toe, since he was all hero all the time. So much so that the tick never removes his costume, even when he is in his secret identity of Neville Ned, weekly World Planet newspaper crossword puzzle editor, in which he only wears a necktie over his costume. And that's it. This overt parody of Superman's crappy civilian disguise of Clark Kent is referenced repeatedly throughout the animated series, as the Tick and his fellow heroes don disguises over their superhero costumes and are still not recognized, even though their costumes are still fully visible. I know that face. Other than his immeasurable strength and durability, the Tick claims that he also possesses drama power, which allows him to make situations more dramatic than they would usually be. Now whether or not this is a real power or just in the Tick's head is unknown, but considering all the insane situations that he gets into on a regular basis, I wouldn't be surprised if this truly is one of his super abilities. Also, he can apparently hold his breath longer than a dolphin, which is actually handier than you might think. Ah, huh, bracing. In 1993, Kisscom, a small toy design and licensing firm, approached Edlund about adapting the character into other mediums. Soon, they partnered with the New York-based animation company Sunbow Entertainment. Together, they produced an animated pilot for an ongoing Tick series, which they pitched to Fox Television, who initially turned it down. Edlund and the team at Sunbow took another pass at the pilot, created a better presentation for the show, and pitched it again, this time impressing Fox enough for them to order the first 13 episodes. And thus, The Tick began his fateful journey as a Saturday morning cartoon. The Blood. The Tick animated series takes place in a world that is overpopulated with superheroes. Unfortunately, most of them are terribly ineffective. The thing is, boys, we've got a lot of these gizmos, and I gotta tell you, they just don't work. Every time we flash the deflator mass signal, he disconnects his phone and leaves town for a week. No mention is made in the series of the Tick being a former mental patient, or about his amnesia. 
Instead, he is introduced on the day that he is attending the National Superhero Institute, where he will be assigned to protect a specific city or country. Of course, he is assigned to protect the city known as the city. Seriously, that is its only name. While the city may already have a cadre of superheroes trying to protect it, not only are most of them horrifically ineffective, but there seem to be enough villains and ridiculous super crimes to go around. Maybe that drama power is real. While on his first patrol, the Tick meets Arthur, a former accountant who acquires a moth suit at a mad scientist auction and decides he wants to be a superhero. The two become partners, and many absurd adventures soon follow. Wherever evil sets its giant, ill-smelling foot, you will find the Tick. Oh, and, and Arthur, his, uh, a sidekick. Good show. Cast in characters. The Tick didn't have a great deal of lead characters, as it mostly focused on the Tick and Arthur. But the supporting cast was amazing, in spite of the fact that most of these characters were terribly underdeveloped. That's not the best picture of me. <laughs> it was a bad ear day. Like all great heroes, the Tick had an excellent rogues gallery. Astonishing arch rivals like the Breadmaster, a villainous baker played by the late great Roddy McDowell. El Seed, a fiendish flower bent on world domination, played by Ed Gilbert. The Terror, played by Rob Paulson an outdated World War II villain who can't seem to die in spite of his advanced age. And the Tick's most menacing malcontent was Chairface Chippendale, voiced by the legendary Tony Jay, the most malevolent of the masterminds. If a criminal plot threatened the entire city, you can bet your bottom dollar that the Furniture Face Fiend was behind it. He's Dean, my best henchman. He has the strongest hands in the criminal world. <laughs> Oh, I like him! As I stated before, the city is filled with a lot of inept superheroes, like the civic-minded five, who mean well but ultimately are about as effective as a trench coat on a turtle. But the absolute worst and most pointless superhero in the city is Deflator Mouse, played by Leonardo himself, Cam Clark. Hey, sweetheart, what you got in that poodle gun? Anything for me? The Flater Mouse was the opposite Batman. Where Batman is swift, professional, and effective, the Flater Mouse is rude, pointless, and cowardly. <laughs> yeah, sour grapes, sweetheart. You had your chance. She'll be back. The one superhero who always stood in between being effective and ineffective was Sewer Urchin, played by Jess Harnell, who, for whatever reason, decided to voice him using an impersonation of Dustin Hoffman's character from Rain Man. Oh, very bad. Definitely unacceptable. Yeah, we better tell the tick. And while the impersonation might be hilarious, I always felt like there was an inside joke there that I wasn't quite getting. So if anybody knows what the deal is with the Rain Man impersonation, feel free to let me know. Initially, Urchin is perceived to be a pointless sewer dweller. But in one of the greatest episodes in the series, The Tick vs. Filth, it turns out that while Urchin might be worthless on the surface world, in the sewers, Urchin is the best at what he does, and what he does isn't very clean. Man, you are so cool down here. Oh yeah, down here I'm considered the apotheosis of cool. Of course, this is a parody of the way non-comic book fans perceive Aquaman. And I have to say, as an Aquaman fan, the reference is appreciated. But the best hero in the city, apart from the Tick, is American May, played by Kay Lenz. An amalgamation of Captain America and Wonder Woman, American May simply kicks ass. She can do anything the boys can do with high heels. And I mean that literally. Oh, it's a woman! I'm so scared! <laughs> Times have changed, Pops. All right, let's discuss our main heroes, the Tick and Arthur. Now, I will be talking about them simultaneously, as they are a unit. You cannot have one without the other, and they complement each other perfectly. In the first season, Arthur was played by none other than Mickey Dolenz of the Monkees, 
And I know that sounds weird, but initially Fox wanted celebrities to play all the main characters. So that's how the former monkey ended up playing the Tick's sidekick. Unfortunately, casting the Tick was a major challenge, as none of the celebrities who auditioned for the part met the high standards set by Ben Edlund. Ultimately, the network caved under desire to cast a celebrity as the Big Blue Behemoth, and allowed Edlin to cast a professional voice actor in the part, and thus, the man that would forever define the way the tick sounds stepped into the role, the great, versatile, and mighty Townsend Coleman. Best known for playing Michelangelo in the original Ninja Turtles, Townie created the definitive sound and cadence for the tick, a very specific style of delivery that has been imitated by every actor who has played the character ever since. Breadmaster, your culinary crime wave has crashed against the shores of justice! Nice! Townie's performance as the tick is such a trademark that when he was cast at a Sentinel Prime in Transformers Animated, the creators changed the design of the character to look more like the Tick. We look cool! Dolenz, on the other hand, only played Arthur in the first season. It is actually documented really well in the voiceover community that Mickey Dolenz is pretty difficult to work with. Uh, Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees, I don't even I don't remember. Yeah, okay, but he's a jerk. <laughs> I'm sorry, he was really mean. Everybody. Maybe he was just in a bad mood, I don't know. But it was funny because Candy Milo, who's a girl that we work with, said uh, before he left, she's like, Oh, Mickey, I just wanted to tell you that when I was little, we used to play a game called Who Gets to Marry a Monkey? But the loser had to marry you. <laughs> Which may have been one of the contributing factors for him leaving the series. So, from season two onward, Arthur was played by Rob Paulson, who was initially brought on the show as a utility player which is the actor that voices all the miscellaneous characters who may pop up once in an episode. While Dolenz did a pretty good job as Arthur, not in the face, not in the face, Rob was just better, capturing the feeble yet charming nature of the character. You and me escape the world and Scottish devils start and rob. Hey, uh, don't you do that or, or I'll be forced to try and stop you. Plus, he just had better chemistry with Townsend Coleman, which should come as no surprise as Paulson voiced Raphael alongside him on Ninja Turtles. Yes, this show had three out of the four original Ninja Turtles playing principal characters. Now, I've often wondered why they never got Barry Gordon, aka Donatello, to do any voices on this show. Well, as it turns out, while The Tick was in production, Barry Gordon was dividing his time between voicing Donatello, being a lawyer, and raising a family, so yeah, his plate was full. As I explained before, The Tick and Arthur are a perfect match. While The Tick is brave, daring, and adventurous, I love this job! <laughs> Arthur is cautious, practical, and logical. In other words, Arthur's the brain and The Tick is the brawn. I've always defined the relationship as if Bruce Banner and the Hulk were separate people, and they had to share an apartment and fight crime together. While the Tick's childlike naivete might make him an uncorruptible force for good, it also drives him to make a lot of boneheaded mistakes. Luckily, Arthur is always there to be the voice of reason, and often steer the Tick in the right direction. And while the Tick might be the one to pummel the bad guys, it is Arthur who generally comes up with the solution that ends up saving the day. Like I said, they are a perfect team. Tick, acetosalicylic acid is aspirin. If we can give Neil a dinosaur-sized dose of aspirin, he might shrink back to normal. The series progression. Now, The Tick is very much an early 90s cartoon, so it was mostly comprised of standalone episodes. Because, at the time, it just wasn't traditional for animated shows to have season-long arcs. So basically, you can start watching this show with any episode and still enjoy it. With that said, every time the creators introduced a small change in the continuity, they were very meticulous about making sure that that change remained consistent. For example, in the second episode, The Tick vs. Chairface Chippendale, the varnished villain decides to carve his name into the moon with a giant laser for his birthday. Because... why not? He only manages to carve the C, H, and most of the A before he's thwarted by The Tick, Arthur, and American Maid. However, those three letters remain on the moon for the rest of the season, 
all the way until the second episode of Season 2, Alone Together, in which NASA recruits the Tick to help erase the letters off the moon, using high explosives. At this point, it should be very clear that giving the Tick high explosives is a bad idea. While the mishap erases the C from the moon, it gets the attention of a very overt parody of Galactus called Omnipotus. And like his Marvel Comics counterpart, he likes to eat planets and sets his sight on the Earth. The Tick, like Mr. Fantastic, convinces him to leave the Earth alone by allowing him to take a bite out of the moon instead. After that, the Omnipotus bite mark remains consistently on the moon for the rest of the show. So while the show might not have had story arcs, the creators, like all true blue comic book fans, very much cared about continuity. While the basic premise for your standard episode was pretty formulaic, evil shows up, the tick fights it until Arthur comes up with a way to defeat it in the final act, and then the tick ends the episode with some hilarious hyperbole. Why do clowns make us laugh? Why do we love puppy dogs? And why... Why do little blue midgets hit me with fish? The style of the show was still very unique, which consisted of superhero parodies coupled with absurdist humor. One minute the creators would be making a bunch of stereotypical superhero jokes like Batman's cape being too long, how difficult it is to find a place to change into your super suit, how lame anti-heroes are, so on and so on. But then the creators would hit you with the most insane concept you have ever seen. Stuff so crazy it would stay tattooed to your brain for the rest of your life. Like when Leonardo da Vinci had a team of crime-fighting, time-traveling super geniuses. Okay, that was both weird and awesome. You want weirder? How about Blowhole? He's a whale that runs on land. Why? Cause that's just what he does. Or like when Brainchild turned the tick into a two-headed bird that only spoke French. Because, um, science? Or when the tick grew a mustache that tried to kill him. And let's not forget in the final season when the tick got a capybara named Speak as a pet, who talks to him in his dreams. I love you. Right on! Which raises a lot of questions. The number one question being, what the hell is a capybara? What? The world's largest rodent? Oh. Well, like I said, the show is weird. Little wooden boy, you take that one! Like all great comedy shows, this one had its series of running gags. I let him have it with both of my shoes and he still kept coming. Oh, both shoes? It is a monster. My personal favorite was how everyone thought Arthur was dressed like a bunny, even though he was supposed to be a moth. It's that stupid bunny outfit. A little bunny guy. You are not gonna hurt the funny bunny man. Oh no, not bunny, sir. Moth. <laughs> it's my moth suit. Actually, it's a flying suit. The wings are in my briefcase. However, my favorite recurring comedy motif was that unlike other superhero shows, in The Tick, you always see the characters doing everyday mundane things. Like washing the dishes, shopping for groceries, and my personal favorite, fixing all the collateral damage caused by their adventures. Most of the heroes, when they have their brawls, they just leave a mess. Happy to do it, Prim King of Waiters. Yeah, you never see the Avengers cleaning up after themselves after they destroyed three quarters of the city trying to save it. While the show might be episodic, the characters do show a bit of evolution and progression. While Arthur starts out being more cowardly and timid, by the end of the show he becomes more outgoing and outspoken, something that becomes more apparent after he starts dating Carmelita Vatos, the daughter of JJ Vatos, the man who invented Arthur's moth suit, who incidentally made a moth suit for Carmelita as well. Wally, man. Uh, it's the costume, Itlan. There were two of them. While the Tick is a big, dumb, childish buffoon, he does learn and evolve as he goes along, like learning to respect Arthur's expenses, as he is the one who pays rent and cab fare, and also learning to accept Carmelita as Arthur's girlfriend, and ultimately learning to support their relationship. Hi, Arthur. Oh, hi, Carmelita. Kiss her. Come on, Arthur. Sit. Stop it. As far as my favorite episodes go, before I talk about them, I have to give honorable mention to the Christmas episode, The Tick Loves Santa, which I love so much, I watch it every year during the holiday season. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas to you! Spoon! 
Now, which one is my favorite episode? It's a solid tie between two episodes. The first one being Heroes, which is a parody of the TV series Cops. But instead of a camera crew following police officers around, here they follow the Tick and Arthur on patrol. So the entire episode is from the point of view of their cameras. And it is so funny, I wouldn't be able to describe it here and do it justice. You're just gonna have to check it out for yourself. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Bulba, we're shooting an episode of Heroes, and I was wondering... Heroes? You, uh, I love that show. Yeah, if you would mind signing a release form for us. It's just a formality for the guys in legal, so we can use you on the show. Certainly. And my second favorite episode is The Tick vs. Dot and Neil's Wedding. On the day that Arthur's sister plans to tie the knot with Dinosaur Neil, who has the power to turn into a giant kaiju-type monster, the Tick's greatest enemies join forces to gain control of Neil and force him to use his powers to destroy the city. So the Tick, Arthur, and his sister Dot, not that one, must travel inside Neil in a submarine to reverse the process, save the city, and make it back in time to the temple to finish the ceremony. Not only is this episode a great parody of every superhero wedding comic ever published, as well as Fantastic Voyage, but this is also the episode where we find out that Arthur is Jewish. Is anybody else wondering how he gets his antenna through his yarmulke? It, you know what? It doesn't matter. It was a beautiful ceremony. Mazel tov. Thank you, Tick. Arthur, for all your help. You're welcome, newlyweds. And thank you for teaching us all that love is thicker than most bodily membranes. The show ended appropriately enough with the episode The Tick vs. Education, in which The Tick and Arthur teach a crime-fighting class for potential superheroes. While the episode lacks the epic finality of your standard final episode, I thought it was very fitting that the show ended with The Tick and Arthur passing on everything that they learned during the three seasons of the show to the next generation. But of course, they do so with their trademark brand of absurd humor. Oh, right. <laughs> Alright, people, don't forget your battle cries! It's okay to play with dolls! Mama! 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 The Cancellation. So after three seasons of fighting supervillains, protecting the city, and having awesome adventures through time and space, Fox Television canceled the show. And it wasn't out of malice. Everyone loved the show. Unfortunately, it wasn't the merchandising juggernaut that shows like Ninja Turtles and Spider-Man were. So because The Tick wasn't selling them tapes and toys, Fox had no choice but to cancel the show. And I know that sounds unfair, but unfortunately that is the nature of the beast when it comes to children's programming. You have to move merchandise in order to stay on the air. And besides, The Tick had three full seasons. That is a pretty standard run for your average animated show. So this was nothing to be ashamed of. However, I do have one major complaint about the show's cancellation. And that is that they never released the whole show on DVD. First of all, they only released seasons 1 and 2 on DVD. Secondly, both sets are missing on episode. Season 1 is missing The Tick vs. The Mole Men, and Season 2 is missing Alone Together, which as I mentioned before, is a very important episode. And then, on top of all that, they never released Season 3. At all! So, could Buena Vista Home Video, Shout Factory, or somebody please release the complete series on DVD? It's only 36 episodes, and they're only 20 minutes each. I don't think that's too much to ask. Ugh. So, while we're on the subject of harmless requests... The 2001 Live Action Series. Okay, I know a lot of you are gonna ask me about the second Tick adaptation. So, very briefly, here's my opinions on it. It was okay. Just okay. The humor was on par with all the other Tick incarnations, and Patrick Warburton did a great job playing the character, but the action and the fantasy element were barely there. It was fairly obvious that they had a much bigger scope in mind, but the budget and the resources just weren't there. For this reason, I only feel comfortable recommending this show to hardcore Tick fans. I give it a 6. And most of those points go to the writing and Patrick Warburton's performance. So there you go. Alright, now let's finish talking about the animated series. Final Verdict One of my favorite aspects of this show is that while it might have started out as something that was heavily influenced by superhero comics... I am mighty. I am mighty! 
In time, it started to influence the genre in return. Like The Incredibles opening with candid interviews and testimonials. The Tick did that first. And don't tell me that when the Hulk was wrestling Horfin's tongue in Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, that that wasn't a direct reference to The Tick. And the fact of the matter is that there is yet to be a better superhero parody. While there might be some good ones out there like Darkwing Duck, Freakazoid, and Mystery Men, no one was better at satirizing superheroes than The Tick. What do we do now? Well, we find the vegetable villain who did this to me and get the antidote. There's an antidote? Villains always have antidotes. They're funny that way. So like The Tick, I also shout my nonsensical catchphrase. Ten points on that badassitude meter, grab your sidekick, answer the call of justice, and give it a watch. Until next time, I'm Erod, and I'm the Blockbuster Buster. You're as alive as a daisy. <laughs> <laughs>